Hi, all right. Histology of the large intestine, or the uh, the microscopic anatomy of the large intestine. Now this should be fairly straightforward. We're working our way through the gastrointestinal tract. We've looked at the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine. So we're getting used to the layers of tissue that make up this tube. The mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, and then the, the serosa or the adventitia. We're going to see exactly the same thing again but it's gonna be simpler than the small intestine because it has a simpler job to do than the small intestine. And we're gonna look at how those layers of tissue are different in the large intestine because of the functions of the large intestine. We're relating the microscopic structure to the function of the large intestine. All right, let me find my slide. So the, uh, the large intestine, or the colon, um, it's, a, it's a tube about a metre and a half long. It's, it's larger than the small intestine. It has a larger diameter. Its job, or jobs, its main job is to absorb water from what gets that far. I mean, the intestines are very good absor at absorbing water, but in the large intestine, the water is being removed from the contents to make feces, to make the stool, to compact the stool down. And it's also going to absorb electrolytes, salts, uh, potassium, uh, chlorides, uh, salt, uh, sodium, that sort of thing, right? Um, so that means it's not doing what the small intestine did. It's not doing... Uh, those digestion jobs and those, absorb <laughs> those, those absorption jobs of absorbing lots of different molecules, lots of different um, nutrients. So it's not absorbing all those complex molecules. It's got a much simpler job to do. Uh, so we don't see the same levels of complexity. Okay, what have we got here? Oh, by the way, fun fact. There's this weird fad in the world at the moment where you... You have to drink so much water during the day. You know, it's usually a random amount, like two litres or something. So you carry around this big bottle and you you tick off the amount of water you drink through the day or you uh, you have an app that <laughs> and you mark how much water you drink. Uh, you can actually get water from what you eat, from your food. The small intestine, the large intestine is doing that, the small intestine is doing that, the stomach's doing it. There's a lot of water in your food. You can get the water out of your food. That, that's a normal thing. I mean, most biologists roll their eyes, I think, when you talk about having to drink a certain amount of water. But you get water from your food, and you can drink water in any solution. And your, your GI tract is, does a brilliant job of pulling the water out and putting it into your body. And then your body does a brilliant job of uh, trying to make sure you've got the right amount of water inside you. Um, wow, okay, so this is a big, big, chunky section. Um, the only advantage to drinking lots of water that I've seen any evidence for is reducing the risk of uh, kidney stones. If you've got a risk of developing kidney stones, sure. You know, keep your urine well, well diluted. Um, so we've got a lot of folds here. Now, we've got a lot of folds because this is quite a large tube, so it has is folded up. Um, in the centre of the frame there, we're looking at the mucosa. And the mucosa is made up of an epithelium supported by connective tissue, the lamina propria. And there's a layer of muscularis mucosa there, a little layer of smooth muscle, just as we saw in the rest of the GI tract. Uh, I'm going to zoom in and look at this in more detail in a moment. So then there's the mucosa, and then as we go down here, we see the submucosa, which is looking pretty thick in this particular section. And in the submucosa, we're seeing lots of lovely blood vessels. We can still see the blood cells inside them, right? So we're seeing lots of blood vessels, and we, there will be nerves in there and lymphatics and um, glandular structures. And then as we go further towards the outside of the large intestine, we see our two muscle layers. So we see, um, that's maybe a bit better there. There is a circular ring of smooth muscle going around the gastrointestinal tract, going around the large intestine, which can change the diameter of the large intestine. And then we have an outer layer 
of longitudinal muscle, which can make the, the length of the tube shorter and relax to let it get longer. And those two things, those two groups of muscles work together in a very well-organized fashion to cause peristalsis, which moves the contents along the lumen of the large intestine. And I'm at, um, I'm using the four times objective. I've got 10 times to my eyes here, which makes a 40 times magnification for me. How magnified this is for you will vary a little bit depending upon the size of your screen. But what we can see here is that those are two pretty significant muscle layers that we've got here. And in fact, that outer longitudinal muscle layer, when we look at the human large intestine, we see three long bands, uh, the tinea coli, three long bands of muscle on the outside of the, uh, the large intestine. And actually, they, they kind of like pinch up the, uh, the large intestine, so we get these little haustra, these like sacculations. So that's the general over overview. And look, out there again, we can see some connective tissue. So we can see the serosa um, or the adventitia, if you like. So the, the general layout of the large intestine matches everything that we've seen so far in the gastrointestinal tracts. That makes life a bit easier, right? I don't know about you, but this is doing wonders for me because, of course, I keep repeating myself. We look at another bit of the tube and we see all the same layers, which is helping imprint it on my brain. Okay then, let's zoom in. Uh, well, first of all, um, that's the mucosa. And I would just point out that we've got circles here because we're cutting through essentially tubes in different planes of sections. We've got lots of folds because the, uh, the large intestine is kind of, it's, it's, it's squids like this, right? So it's, it's the circular muscle is contracted, let's say, and it's caused folds inside the lumen. Um, so let's jump up. Uh, so I'm using my what, what's that? My ten times objective. <laughs> Looking very edgy you now. Um, so we are looking at the mucosa. Um, all right. So, what do we know about the small intestine and the stomach? Well, the small intestine, we saw lots of villi. We don't see any villi in the large intestine. So, up there, that's like the surface. So imagine, um, at a gross level, you've got your large intestine, you've opened it up, you're looking at the inside surface of the large intestine, and, you know, it's essentially it's a flat sheet in there that's curled up. And in that flat sheet, you would see millions of tiny little holes, tiny little pores going down into the, into the tissue of the, the large intestine. And these are the intestinal crypts, the crypts of Lieberkuhn, just like we saw in the small intestine. But in the small intestine, we saw these, then we saw lots of villi sticking up into the lumen, into the, into the intestinal space. There are no villi in the large intestine. It has a much simpler job to do, so it doesn't have the same surface um, area adaptations. Um, and we can see a lot of goblet cells in there, can't we? Let's go up to the higher power. So this is a 20 times magnification. This is, this is an epithelium. It's a simple columnar epithelium just like the small intestine, but it's very difficult to see that simple columnar epithelium. We're just seeing lots and lots and lots of goblet cells. And these goblet cells look like that because they're producing mucin. That mucin is going to become mucus. So the cells, the, the epithelial cells of the large intestine, we've got, we do have enterocytes, but we've got a lot of goblet cells which are making a lot of mucus, which is going to, protect, or we can see the surface a bit better there, can't we, which is going to protect the surface epithelial cells and of course it's going to lubricate everything moving along inside the colon. So just like in the small intestine, these epithelial cells, these enterocytes, these are the cells that are largely responsible for absorption of nutrients and salts and anything else that gets absorbed in the large intestine. Um, so they pass molecules across them into the blood and the lymphatics in there. But they don't last very long. They last maybe five or six days, I think, in the human large intestine they survive because they just get abraded away by the contents of the large intestine moving along because we're eating all the time, eating every day, and things are moving along our large intestine, right? So they get abraded. Now, 
and they get lost. And because it's a simple epithelium, that is, that means it's a single layer of cells, um, you don't have the multiple layers that we see in the skin, where the top layers get abraded away and new layers come in underneath. Um, in the large intestine, down here in the intestinal crypts, we've also got stem cells. And the stem cells are going to replace the epithelial cells, the enterocytes, the goblet cells. And also down here we're going to have uh, uh, enteroendocrine cells, so endocrine cells of the gut that are signaling and controlling, switching on and off many of the processes of the gastrointestinal tract. We saw paneth cells in the small intestine, and paneth cells are involved in regulating the microbes and the microbial environment of the gut. We don't normally see paneth cells in the large intestine, but we see those in the small intestine. So, um, enterocytes, loads of goblet cells, uh, enteroendocrine cells, and stem cells. And those stem cells are down in these crypts down here, and they will produce new copies of all of those cells, and the epithelial cells will migrate to the top, and the other cells will migrate down, and so on. So the crypts are shorter here than the small intestine. And look, so what we've got is, see, this is why I picked this section, is because you can see there's the surface, right? So that's the inside of the large intestine. That's the little tiny hole you would see if you were looking. And then as you go down, it's a tubular, uh, a tubular crypt, tubular intestinal crypt or crypt of Lubacoon. These also get called um, intestinal glands. Um, so that's a tube, which means that if you cut perfectly along the length of that tube, they look like this. But if you were to if those, imagine those tubes are wiggling in different directions. If you cut through the tube uh, transversely or axially, that's why you get these shapes here, these oval shapes and these round shapes. They're the same structure. They're just passing, not at that angle, they're passing at that angle and they've been cut through like that. But these are all intestinal crypts. And you can just see the huge number of goblet cells that we've got here. Like much of the gastrointestinal tract then, it's the focus on the mucosa of the epithelium and its relations to function, which is where we see the most significant differences. Um, so large intestine, no villi, intestinal crypts, um, lots of uh, goblet cells. And in here, so the other parts of the mucosa are the lamina propria, so all of this here is being supported by um, connective tissue. The lamina propria is connective tissue supporting the epithelium in here. We can see some streaky things in there. So there will be some uh, tiny, tiny capillaries and lymphatics, which is where the water that's absorbed and the salts that are absorbed are going to go to. They're going to go into the, into the blood and probably into the lymphatics as well because the lymphatics are always picking up fluid from tissues. Um, so we have the epithelium, the lamina propria, and then as we go down here we see this thin layer. These are smooth muscle cells. I can jump up a bit higher. So these are smooth muscle cells. And this is the muscularis mucosa again. Um, and if we're in a higher power, so I'm using my what's that, 40 times objective. We can have another look at these intestinal crypts. So again, there's the surface. Our simple columnar epithelium again. We go down into the intestinal crypt and we see lots of goblet cells producing mucus. And in between those, we see um, capillaries, lymphatics, the lamina propria supporting all of this. And as we descend down to the base of these intestinal crypts, we see the muscularis mucosa. And that, those layers make up the mucosa. And as we go further down, this isn't very well stained, so let me go back out to the lower power. Let me pick something that's actually stained as well. So the next layer is the submucosa. As I said, in here then we're seeing blood vessels, and we can see these blood vessels making some very cool shapes, actually. These blood vessels um, 
Still got blood cells in them. So the submucosa we find arterioles, venules, lymphatic vessels, nerves. So the submucosa is uh, supporting everything else. Not seeing many glandular structures in here. And then as we go through the submucosa, we get to that muscle there. So the uh, muscularis externa. And I said that was two layers. So here we can see we can see smooth muscle cells. Some of them are a little bit wriggly. And these are moving left to right across the screen. So this is the circular layer. So can you imagine how this section has been cut? This is the inner circular layer of uh, smooth muscle of the muscularis externa. And as we slide down towards the outside of the large intestine, we can see how we've got the same cells, smooth muscle cells again, but now they've been cut through transversely. They're going, they're going that away towards you. They've been cut through like that. So that's the, the, the longitudinal cells. Um, and they, this is just the way the tissue has been cut that they appear in this way. So, and that, that's a pretty sizable um, layer of muscle here because we've got a larger tube. Uh, we've got to propel the contents along. And of course, as the water's getting absorbed, the feces are becoming compacted to make stools. So that possibly takes a little bit more effort to squeeze along as the contents get compacted. And the mucus really helps there as well. And then, you know, we will also see um, blood vessels and nerves supporting this. Um, and we'll even see them between the two layers as well, actually. Um, and then as we get to the outside, here we go. This is just the connective tissue supporting... On the, this is the connective tissue on the outside of the large intestine. So the serosa might be called the adventitia. We're seeing fat cells, we're seeing more blood fat cells, we're seeing a little bit of connective tissue holding it all together. And that is it. That is the histological structure of the large intestine. So we've really um, cut our teeth on the esophagus, the stomach, and the parts of the small intestine, where there's a lot more going on, a lot more detail. So when we go to something like the large intestine, it's easy peasy. Uh, we know what we're talking about. We know what we're looking at, hopefully. <laughs> but that's the microscopic structure of the, uh, the large intestine. And understanding this microscopic structure is crucial to understanding what goes wrong in disease, because it's all about the cells in disease. You know, we talked about um, a little bit about um, um, celiac disease with the small intestine. We've got to think about irritable bowel disease, which is actually an umbrella term for lots of different syndromes. But when you understand the cellular organisation of the anatomy of the large intestine, the pathology, the disease, why things happen how things recover, it all makes so much more sense. Um, thinking cancers and tumours as well, right? Colon, colon cancer. These are the cells that colon cancer forms from. How's that? By looking at the microscopic structure, we better understand how the arrangement of cells is related to the functions of the different parts of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, ooh, um... Fun fact. <laughs> so these layers that we're looking at here, when you get to the anal canal, the internal anal sphincter is a thickening of that circular inner um, layer of muscle there. Anyway, maybe we'll. I've got. I've still got some slides with appendix and anal canal. Oh, I've got liver and. I've got all, still got lots of GI things to look at. So we might go back to some more GI tract um, next week. But so far, we've made it to the large intestine. We're almost out the other end. This is great. Okay, I hope that was useful. Hope it was interesting. Uh, see you next week. Bye.